learning about invasive species. My name is Molly Murphy, and I'm the Plant Pono Specialist for the Big Island Invasive Species Committee. We are streaming live on Facebook, and we are recording this Zoom session, just so you know. We have our whole outreach team here with us. We have Kaveji Lopez, our Community Outreach Specialist, who will monitor our Facebook live stream. Any questions you have, just pop them into the comment box and Kavehi will get the, the questions to us. Jade Miyashiro in Hilo will be monitoring our Zoom. If you have any comments or questions on Zoom, please use a Q&A box. It's a little easier for us to monitor. Uh, again, this is a live presentation that we're streaming live on Facebook and it's being recorded. Keep an eye out for our poll and please participate. It's really good to have audience participation in our polls. Um, so I guess we pretty much have our housekeeping out of the way. So sit back and relax and listen to tonight's talk, the history of invasive species in Hawaii. Our presentation tonight is Franny Brewer, the communications director extraordinaire from the Big Island Invasive Species Committee which is a University of Hawaii program that works island-wide to address and respond to invasive species that affect our environment, economy, and health. Franny has lived in Hawaii for two decades and holds degrees from UH Hilo and Chaminade University. She also earned a certificate in sustainability and behavior change from UC San Diego. Franny manages the BISC Outreach and Education Program, which engages residents from Keiki to Kapuna to protect our forests, farms, reefs, and homes from damaging pests. She is particularly interested in creating programs to empower communities to respond to invasive species threats. So without further ado, here is Franny Brewer. Thank you, Molly, for that great introduction. Um, I have the, the poll is still up as people are joining. Uh, please just complete that poll. We'll probably stop that in a moment, but I really appreciate you all joining us tonight for the beginning of Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. Uh, this is the first time that we've gone all virtual with Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month, and tonight is our first webinar, but we have a series that's coming up um, Almost every day this month, you can find something uh, that, that's that's being presented across the state. So lots of great speakers and talks, and I'm really glad uh, that you're joining me tonight. I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen. So let's see how that goes. And I know it's dinner time, so I hope that you're uh, all sitting back with a nice snack. while we talk about invasive species. All right, so team, how is that looking? Uh, it's in the presenter view right now, it Got looks it. like. Now? Okay, I think we're good. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk tonight just to background overview of the histories of species coming to Hawaii, all the different species that have come to Hawaii and, and how we refer to those. And we'll talk a little bit about the impacts on our environment, economy, and health, which as we'll learn is the definition of invasive species. Um, we're not going to talk about every single invasive species in Hawaii tonight because that would be impossible. I don't want to keep you all here until one in the morning, but we have more than 50 of the 100 worst invasive species in the world as defined by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And we have a long history, unfortunately, because we are particularly vulnerable here in Hawaii. So I want to give you kind of an overview of, of uh, our natural history here in the islands and how we ended up in this uh, situation. So we have to start by thinking about place. 
Hawaii is more than 2,000 miles away from the nearest continental system. And, you know, if you took biology in college or maybe way back in high school, you might remember um, a lot of life, when they talk about the development of life on Earth, terrestrial life, um, it really revolves around continental systems, right? But we are not the type of island that sort of broke off and drifted uh, away from a continental system. This is, as we on the big island know, only too well. Um, we are a hotspot in the Pacific where, uh, let, me, uh, let me get rid of this, where a lava has broken through the crust and is um, forming islands um, up here in, in, on the surface. So there's no life forms that are coming up with all that molten rock. How did life get to Hawaii? We like to share this with, with students. We do a lot of work in classrooms. So a lot of kids will tell you the three W's, wind, wings, and waves. And we also like to you know flip that around literally and give the three M's, Makani, Manu, and Moana. So these are the ways that species were able to cross that more than 2000 mile barrier of open ocean and arrive in Hawaii. It had to be on the wind, on wings, and wings could be the, the, the animal itself or something carried on the animal like a, a seed that a bird digested or snail eggs that could be stuck to mud on a bird's legs or feathers or things that could have drifted through the ocean or swam here on their own. So uh, you see that there are multiple methods for getting across that barrier, but it's a big barrier. And once something arrives here, that's not the final barrier to becoming a species that can live in these islands. They also have to find a food source, they have to find a place to live, make habitat. So um, that's that whole idea to thrive. They have to survive and thrive. Uh, that's another barrier. And then the last barrier is they could live out their lives happily here, uh, but can they reproduce? Can they have offspring that will really allow this to be something that establishes in the islands? And that was such a rare event for a species to make it over all three of those barriers that it's estimated that only happened about once every 10,000 years on average that something would actually make it here. So it was it's a really rare and special event for those species to colonize and arrive in Hawaii. And it's also um, a, a, an unusual opportunity where these species can move into different um, areas of the island and they can change and they can have offspring. Okay. All right. Yeah, if somebody could start the recording, sorry. Okay, so over the years, as things moved into their new environment, a lot of them evolved into entirely new species. So all of those ancestral species that got here via, via wind, wings, and waves, as they crossed out across the islands, there were a lot of niches available because there wasn't a lot of stuff here. So they were able to really take advantage of that open territory and become something new. And so what you see is this evolution of new species that had not existed in the world before, but were taking advantage of this unique landscape here in in Hawaii. Um, when you learn about evolution and you learn about biology, you might hear about Darwin's finches. Darwin went down to the Galapagos Islands and he discovered that there were 13 finches that were all related. They were all descended from a single common ancestor. And this sort of sparked the whole uh, on the origin of species and, and uh, the theory of evolution. But too bad that Darwin never made it to Hawaii, where you can actually see 52 new species descended from a single ancestral species, an Asian finch that arrived a couple millennia ago, um, and then all of those descendants of that species branching out into different parts of the island using different food sources, uh, different habitats, changing color depending on what tree they spent their time in. So we saw just this amazing example of adaptive radiation. Um, and all the birds get a lot of love and a lot of attention. We don't necessarily celebrate so much our native insects, but Hawaii has this really, really rich invertebrate community, um, which is really made even more special knowing that only about 450 times was an insect able to cross those three barriers, that open ocean, that thriving, and that reproducing, only about 450 times. Uh, but that led to the development of more than 5,000 insect species that we know of. And these insect species are pretty special. We have things like um, <coughs> our koa bug, which is a uh, stink bug that has lost its stink. You have the vacayu bug, which is only at the top of Mauna Kea up there waiting for the bodies of uh, dead insects to blow up the mountain. That's its food source. Um, 
We have about a thousand species of lepidopterans, which are moths and butterflies, but only two of those are butterflies. All the rest are moths. And that kind of makes sense if you think about this was an island full of birds, lots and lots and lots of birds. So if you're going to be a little flying insect, probably a little safer to be out at night than during the day uh, with all those birds around. So we do have our Kamehameha butterfly and our Koa butterfly, but most of uh, our Lepidopterans are moths. So just really unusual insect communities and, and created some really beautiful things. So how, what changes? Well, humans, humans arrive and humans tend to bring things with them. So that's where you start to get things that are introduced, introduced species about 1500 years ago when the Polynesians arrived in these islands, um, they brought with them, as humans do, we like to bring stuff with us. They brought with them the species that uh, they had, that they liked from home. And so you see that background rate go from about one every 10,000 years to about one every 25 years, a new species on average. Most of those probably came in the first 10 years, but about an average of 25. So a big jump. And those introduced species um, came both intentionally, so things like food plants, so kalo or ulu, these were the beloved important food plants uh, to the folks that were colonizing these islands. And those are not things that could have gotten here on their own. So a, a, a huli cannot float 2,400 miles across the ocean in salt water, right? Like the, these plants would get destroyed. So they needed human care and they needed an introduction. So those are the first introductions. Those are the first things that got here with the help of humans. And those first plants actually have a special designation. They're called canoe plants because they reflect that these were very important special plants that were brought by the first humans that came here and they came via canoe. So you have things like banana, sugarcane, stuff that you're probably familiar with still persists to this day. You know, we still have people cultivating those and they're still important uh, food crops to this day. So canoe plants hold a special uh, place in, in Hawaiian history. Um, unfortunately, sometimes uh, introductions can be harmful. And worldwide, and you see this in many places, about 10% of things that are introduced can cause some level of harm. Uh, and sometimes that goes about 1% of the time we're talking about severe harm. So things that were intentionally introduced by the first humans, dogs were brought, um, probably accidental introduction of rats, those things that got here, there was no mammal, mammalian predators. There just weren't mammals here. The only terrestrial Hawaiian mammal is the Hawaiian hoary bat. And so everything was birds and insects. And a lot of those um, animals here didn't have any kind of defense against those new introductions. They didn't have behavioral defenses. Um, you're probably familiar with the nene goose, which is our state bird, but there were at least two other species of large flightless birds that existed, um, which were quickly driven to extinction, probably through hunting, but also through predation. The kind of predation we see today where rats go up in the nest and they eat the eggs or dogs attack the, the birds on the ground because they can't fly and get away. So unfortunately, things like uh, our snails that, were, that are a favorite snack of rats, um, these things started to be harmed uh, with the first introductions. However, the more things you introduce, the more chance there is that some of those introductions are going to be harmful. And where you really start to see introductions go up in rate is uh, around the late 1700s when Westerners began coming to Hawaii and looking for money, right? The, this, was, this was the big Central Pacific whaling community. So if, back in the 1700s, 1800s, if you were trying to uh, go out there and make your fortune, the way to do that was through whaling because that was the oil and gas of its days. That's, that's where you many products, whale meat, uh, fuels, all kinds of things were being made from whales. So you have a lot of traffic coming through Hawaii um, for those whales. And there's a direct connection between that traffic that started back in the late 1700s and what uh, the situation is for our forest birds today. So with those whalers came water, right? Because they're spending months and months at sea, the fresh water was a need for the sailors on those ships. Unfortunately, we all know what can stow away in fresh water. And in the early 1800s, um, the first mosquitoes were accidentally introduced to Lahaina aboard one of these ships. 
At the same time, you have this introduction of a new style of uh, hunting. So while Hawaiians hunted birds and other things that were in the forest, pigs were generally kept in pens because you wanted to make them nice and fat before you killed them and, you know, make sure that they're they're right there when you're ready to have your celebration and have your luau. So um, with the introduction of guns and uh, the bigger European boar that mixed with the Polynesian pigs, um, you start to see a different behavior where pigs are actually going up into the forest uh, for hunting. And we all know, or maybe you don't have a backyard right now like mine, but this is my backyard kind of looks like this right now. It's very frustrating. Pigs can be pretty destructive. And a, a native Hawaiian forest wouldn't have mud puddles, right? They were just big sponges where everything is nice and green. And so when you have this overturning of earth and these puddles that form, that provides breeding grounds for mosquitoes. So that allows the mosquitoes up into the forest. And unfortunately, uh, those mosquitoes carry diseases from non-native introduced birds uh, that our native birds weren't exposed to. And so they had no resistance to things like avian pox and avian malaria, which really devastated our forest bird species. So of those really awesome, that awesome example of adaptive radiation, those 52 species from one ancestor, only 18 are left and six are critically endangered. So this is a, a big um, problem that we're trying to overcome in conservation. How do we save those birds that are left? Animals like uh, birds that we have here, insects, even plants, things going extinct have led to the unfortunate label for Hawaii being the extinction capital of the United States. We have more um, plants and animals and insects on the endangered species list than any other state by far. And we are actually, because we are a hotspot of biodiversity in the world, like most other hotspots of biodiversity, we are also facing an extinction crisis. That applies, as I mentioned, plants. That applies not just to animals, but it also applies to plants. So our plants in Hawaii had, over that millennia, evolved to lose a lot of the natural defenses that they had against mammalian herbivores. So we have things like, you might have heard of the famous mintless mints. We have a mint that lost that chemical. It didn't need to put energy into that anymore. It could just grow um, bigger and, and, and into more areas. That's where it could put its energy. We have things like a raspberry the akala that lost its thorns because it didn't need to fight off predators anymore. So instead you get these really big berries, um, you know, so plants could put their energy into other things and they lost those defenses against herbivores. So the destruction of herbivores or the, the introduction of herbivores was one of the most destructive um, sort of elements that happened in Hawaiian history. Those ungulates, things that are herb herbivorous, they have the, the hooves, um, cows, sheep. If you're following what's going on on Molokai with the deer, you know, you can really see what happens when those herbivores get out into a landscape and sort of strip it and they're, they're losing resources and something like a drought comes along. Um, these islands aren't really built to maintain those populations. So you see a lot of damage that comes from ungulates. And um, Hawaii has a long history of ranching. So you saw a lot of loss of those upslope forests, both for the sandalwood trade and also for, um, for ranching. But what was happening at the same time is as those cows and sheep and goats are sort of chomping away at all that vegetation, you start to lose uh, that vegetation and then you start to lose soil. So what was becoming quite noticeable to farmers and folks who were uh, maintaining the, the quality of the land and the water was that there was a loss going on. And this is a picture that I took uh, from, I was on Koho Olave. So if you're familiar with the story of Koho Olave, um, it was used as a bombing target for many years by the US military. Well, one of the reasons it was chosen as a bombing target is because the land was highly degraded. And that was because for a long time, for many decades, different folks had come along and tried to make it a sheep or goat ranch. And it really never took off as being very successful. So often these, these endeavors would go belly up and then those animals would get abandoned on the island. And they basically stripped the entire um, uh, island of all of its forests and vegetation. So that results in um, significant loss of soil. And every day that we were there for a week on Ko'olawe, you could see these clouds like this of this red dirt blowing off into the ocean. Um, this is something that 
uh, you know, when we talk about that Malka to Mackay connection, you really see the impact on the environment upslope coming down and impacting even, you know, well out into the ocean. But that sediment that runs off creates a uh, layer over our cor coral reefs, impacting the coral, impacting nearshore fisheries, right, really reducing the yield of the fishery. So you see this big connection between what's going on in the land. When you look at the top of that ridge there, that red is not natural. That is not what a Hawaiian forest or a Hawaiian landscape should look like where you have this bare ground. There, we had lots of wonderful dryland plants and dryland trees that are adapted to live in that environment. But over the years, because of the impact of those sheep and goats, what you saw was that that vegetation loss led to the loss of 15 to 16 feet of topsoil. So now as when you know as part of restoration teams over there you have to bring soil in because there, you can't just put a plant in the ground you can't just put a plant there there's no biological material in in the ground. Um, that soil is gone so it's a huge huge impact um, on on the landscape. And what's interesting is that although the concept of invasive species really doesn't exist in biology until about the 1960s People may not have thought about it in terms of invasive species, but they sure thought about it in terms of, whoa, this is a problem. So at the time, the territory of Hawaii uh, worked with the Forest Service to establish a forestry division, uh, forestry and agriculture, and they were very concerned about that erosion, right? The, that loss of soil, that's what you need to grow food. So there was uh, an effort to step in and reverse that loss. And it's kind of interesting, but um, uh, there's another talk coming up next week, and I think it's called uh, The Path of Good Intentions or something like that, because, you know, we all know what road you are on when you're just full of good intentions. And, and unfortunately, at that time, no one was really thinking about plants as having invasive uh, or, or damaging qualities. What they wanted to look for was we want plants that are fast growing, they mature really quickly, they'll just get into the landscape and spread really fast and sort of take over. And we know now that those are not great characteristics uh, because those are characteristics of invasive species, but they were really looking for a different function then. So what you saw in the early 1900s was an introduction of a lot of plants that we now think of as damaging, uh, but they were brought in with good intentions. So one of the examples that uh, we're very familiar with here in Pune is Albizia. And this tree is super fast growing, grows over an inch per day, over 200 feet when it's mature. And it's very, Albizia is the fastest growing tree um, in the world in Hawaii, not uh, in, in its native range. Um, but this tree was brought in in the 1900s by Joseph Rock, who's a beloved botanist. He loved the forest of Hawaii. He was not trying to damage them. He thought he was doing Hawaii a favor. favor. In the 1930s and 1940s, you had the Civilian Conservation Corps who planted these trees along with things like strawberry guava and malochia all over. Um, and the fastest growing tree in the world in Hawaii, it because of that fast growth, it actually drops limbs uh, because the wood is very weak. So you get a lot of damage. And that's considered a very damaging invasive species because it's also environmentally shades out everything else underneath of it. So you lose a lot of your kiki natives when it gets into a, a native area. Environmentally damaging, but also economically damaging. So after the Tropical Storm Azelle in 2014, in that first year responding to Azelle, Helco spent $13 million. They've since probably spent double that in just responding to Albizia, just Albizia. Um, Department of Transportation in one year spent $2 million. Since then, they have spent more. Um, we even talked to them about there was a wind event, just a windstorm, one Valentine's Day a couple years ago that, that blew a bunch of Albizia down a stream in Kohala, and it caused just that one day removing that those trees that were that were up against this bridge was eleven thousand dollars. Ninety percent of fallen tree crawl, calls across the islands are for albizia trees. So this is an ongoing cost to us, the taxpayers um, and the utility <laughs> owners, because this is something that we have to to deal with. 
Um, so you have that economic impact, that environmental impact, and there's a there's sort of indirect costs that um, you know we don't necessarily always think about. But this is from the 1960s, a picture of Rainbow Falls in Hilo, and if you look in that background, you can actually see Mauna Kea from Hilo, from Rainbow Falls, standing in that overlook. That is not what you would see today. And there's pretty much nothing in that photo that I can identify as a native tree. So it's really unfortunate that people come to Hawaii and they think, oh, look at this beautiful landscape. And this is not a Hawaiian landscape anymore. Like this is very much uh, a lot of introduced species. And most of these are something we would consider to be invasive species. Um, again, this is a little bit further up uh, the um, Wailuku River. Um, just really see this takeover. And it's really interesting because in 1980, you can see one single Albizia tree. And in the foreground here, you see that one African tulip. And the next thing you know, the whole area is uh, taken over. And it happens pretty quickly, right? 20, 30 years, and you got a completely different landscape. And so what we see, whether it's a plant or an animal, uh, very similar characteristics. These things, if it's an animal, it might actually prey on um, a native species, or it could as a plant out compete or even an animal out compete native species for resources. They are across the board things that quickly mature and reproduce. Uh, they're aggressive about going into new areas. So not a plant that needs a lot of help and a lot of care. It's going to be something that's going to get out there on its own. Um, and those things do end up transforming landscapes. There is a federal definition for what you would consider an invasive species. So the first part is that it has to be a non-native species. So something that was introduced by humans. Um, and really that's important because just because it's a pest to you or it's something that you don't like to have around, it doesn't mean that it's invasive. It could be a native species that for some reason you don't like it, um, but that would not make it an invasive species. And it's in order to meet the definition, it has to first half be non-native, Second half, it has to cause harm. So it can't just be anything that's introduced. I mean, that's most of our food crops. It has to be causing harm in one of three environments or one of three areas, the environment, the economy, or human health. And Hawaii actually added to that definition to include way of life to reflect that in Hawaii, we have um, other considerations about lifestyle or culture that may be different from the rest of the nation and that those are important too. And so one example I want to give, uh, fruit flies around the world, especially these tephridid fruit flies, they are known as uh, invasive species in lots of places because they are so damaging. They attack 400 plus species of fruits and vegetables. Um, and that costs our farmers having these four fruit flies, which all got here accidentally to Hawaii, that costs our farmers $300 million every year in either trying to manage these guys and pesticides or loss to their crops or reduce yield, you're getting a lot of costs due to fruit flies. It also has influenced what we are able to export. So you can you look around and say, God, this climate is just wonderful here in Hawaii. We can grow so many wonderful things. And why, why is California getting that fruit from Mexico or, or Central America? Well, they're not getting it from us because we are under a fruit fly exclusion quarantine through the US Department of Agriculture. We're the only state where the whole state is in this quarantine um, and has been for years. We can't ship certain fruits and veggies to the mainland because if they carry these fruit flies in, it would be a threat um, to mainland agriculture. So this is huge in, in shaping our agriculture. So big, big, big economic costs. However, I want to point out one aspect of one of those flies, the melon fly. Um, you're probably familiar with these ipu that are really well established part of Hawaiian culture. They were used in daily life by ancient Hawaiians, right? They're used for household things, um, but they're used today ceremonially. Uh, they're, you know, use their art. They're beautiful. They're decorative. Um, lots and lots of uh, history and tradition and culture attached to this plant. And this was one of those canoe plants, something that was brought by the first humans that came here. Um, but today it's almost impossible because of the melon fly to grow these gourds to that large size. And so for the last couple of decades, most of those gourds are coming from growers in California. So we are now a net importer of Ipo rather than a, an exporter or, or even a grower just for our own needs. Um, there are people that are trying to figure out ways to continue to 
grow these to a large size, but it takes intensive management to do it. You have to really be on top of it. And this used to be something that grew easily and plentifully uh, back in the day. So it's kind of sad to see things like this are quietly lost. So what's happening today with invasive species? Well, we're still, even though we have some laws and we have some understanding of, hey, we, we can't continue to let this happen, um, there's still a lot of accidental things happening because we have so much global traffic um, coming into Hawaii. So we have a 2002 report uh, that estimated about one new insect species was arriving in Hawaii every day. That's, that's just insects. So we went from that background rate of once every 10,000 years to first humans once every 25 years now, just insects, not all the organisms, but just insects, <laughs> one every day. So that's a lot when you sort of compound all of those things together. Now, they have to still meet the, they met the first barrier, but they still have to overcome those next two barriers, right? They have to survive and thrive, and then they have to reproduce. Not all of them are going to do that. That is still true. But about 17 new insect species do establish each year in Hawaii. Those are considered introduced because they got here with human help whether or not they're going to cause harm and then make it into the category of invasive, uh, we often don't know until we start to see harm. So, you know, we, we do have those things kind of sneaking in. Um, sometimes you'll see headlines about the things that get here sneaking in that are kind of big um, or things that are intentionally being smuggled in. Uh, things like lizards, every snake that has been found on the Big Island in the last several years has been a snake that is in the pet trade, which is a really good indicator that those were probably very much intentionally smuggled into Hawaii. That does still happen and it's happening, um, you know, every year. Um, sometimes things are just sneaking in accidentally. So a lot of times we get the these headlines of these things that are caught, but there's also this sort of quiet uh, invasion that's happening that we're not always catching at the border. Um, one of the things that BISC does every year is that we uh, really try to raise awareness about this issue before Christmas because of Christmas trees. We know we've gotten a lot of things over the years from Christmas trees, but they're not the only uh, vector. You know, it's sort of a very high profile live plant that's being imported to Hawaii. Um, but we know that in that live plants are really a key pathway for things coming in. So in 2015, the US Forest Service did a report for Hawaii where they looked at these pathways. How are things, particularly insects and diseases, and they were looking particularly at native forests, but this also impacts agriculture, right? Same pathways um, for, for both forests and agriculture. Where are they coming from? And they, it's a really incredible report. It's, it's available publicly um, and where you can email me and I'm happy to send it to you. But they had six major findings, and I really want to call out number four, which is that plant materials, especially live plants, are by far the most important source of pest problems for Hawaii. So that's an ongoing problem that things are, are sneaking in. And so we have, through Department of Agriculture, we have inspections at our ports, but these are in, intense amounts of cargo. So this is kind of an old number. 7.8 million tons of cargo in 2014. It's well over that at this point, maybe not COVID year, but <laughs> in usual years, um, 100 ships a day coming into Hawaii, Hawaii packed with cargo, right? 790,000 flights per year. And, and on all of these ships is a potential for something to come in that we don't want here. Unfortunately, we had, as of 2019, we had only 82 inspectors for 365 days a year, uh, you know, seven days a week, all year long, 24 hours a day, every ship, every port. There's only 82 people in the entire state who are actually able to do the work of, of doing this inspection. And that's really not um, sufficient. Uh, and so it doesn't give them enough time to sort through everything. And you're also looking at things that are very sneaky. So we can look at something like coffee berry borer. If you know how small coffee cherry is, look at the hole that that borer makes. This would be an incredibly difficult insect to find, even if you were doing a really thorough inspection of every single coffee cherry, which is really impossible. Um, and unfortunately, in 2010, we saw the introduction of this really impactful species, losses in the millions of dollars to our farmers here on this crop that is just valued worldwide. People love Kona coffee, All, you know, Kau coffee was coming up and, and getting a real name for itself. And then those farmers had to deal with this in 
impact of this new species. And just recently, uh, coffee rust has been found here on the Big Island. And that's really devastating because we were one of the last places not to be affected by that disease. And now we have that. So um, when you see these things kind of coming in in modern times, they're usually sneaking in. Cokie frogs, probably it wasn't a frog that got here. It was probably frog eggs. Really difficult to see maybe in a potted plant. Nettle caterpillar, again, a caterpillar egg, little bundle of caterpillar eggs, really hard to see. Um, you know, as we're bringing things in, we are risking that we could be open and vulnerable to these type of things. Little fire ants we know were imported on um, palm trees from Florida. So, you know, I got to think about whether it's worth it to save a few bucks to get our palm trees grown in Florida, or maybe we want to just grow our palm trees here. Um, little fire ants are one of those things really damaging to the environment, obviously, um, but also to the economy. Uh, they farm insects like aphids and mealybugs, so it increases the cost and decreases the yield for farmers. They are a health issue. If anybody's ever been stung by a little fire ant, they're absolutely miserable. And these are, this is, you know, we call this the trifecta. So those three areas of invasive species, does it harm the environment? Yes. Does it harm the economy? Absolutely. Does it harm human health? Uh-huh. Way of life and culture? That too. So this, this one is sort of one of the top invasive uh, problems in Hawaii. Um, Human health, again, you may be familiar with rat lungworm uh, causing so many headlines over the last 20 years in Hawaii. What's really interesting is that rat lungworm, the parasite we know was in Hawaii as far back as the 1950s. Uh, but we didn't have people becoming severely ill uh, through all these decades, right? What changed within the last 20 years? Well, what changed was the introduction of a semi-slug. Again, probably came on, on a potted plant. Slug eggs, kind of not too noticeable. And what you end up with is a vector for this disease that's really, really good at getting those parasites into humans because of its behavior and a number of other things. We have a webinar on this. You can go on our YouTube channel um, if you want to learn more about that. But this particular thing ha is, has caused Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii and Puna and Hilo districts in particular, to be the hot spot in the world, the entire world for severe rat, rat lungworm disease. This is a disease that's in 38 countries that we know about, but we here on the big island are the hot spot, the center, epicenter of the worst disease. And that's because not everybody has that uh, compounding effect of the parasite and the semi-slug in the same place. <laughs> we also, again, cultural um, impacts something that can impact the environment, right? Hala, which is an in indigenous uh, plant, important to coastal environments, but also an important uh, cultural plant. Weaving the hala is a really important traditional Hawaiian um, practice. Excuse me. And that's something that um, this invasive species is impacting the health of those plants. The Nio tree, a lot of people aren't that familiar with it, but it was the second most populous tree in uh, our forest after Ohia, and it was hit by a thrips, a teeny tiny, almost impossible to see insect. Uh, just recently, Oahu had an outbreak and many Nio had to be um, killed because there was no way to stop this spread. They were trying to prevent this from, from continuing to go through many more Nio trees. So we're seeing repeated introductions that could be really damaging. Also on Oahu, the coconut rhinoceros beetle, um, which was brought in from Guam, where it devastated palm trees, total loss uh, in some areas of palms. We don't want to see that happen in Hawaii. <clears throat> Here in Puna, the Queensland longhorn beetle, which is not known to be a pest anywhere in the world. It's a quiet little bug in its home in Queensland, Australia, that doesn't bother anybody. And somehow it got to the big island, probably in packing crate material, and it is exploding into a huge pest. So it, it, it attacks uh, cacao. So it's really impacting our burgeoning cacao and chocolate industry here. And it attacks kukui, which is our state tree. It attacks lots and lots of another canoe plant. It attacks lots and lots of um, species and we're finding more every couple months there's a new species on that list so really scary bug there is no control known for this insect same thing condition in west hawaii on the kona side no control known for the two-line spittle bug came in uh, was first identified as being here in 2016 probably on some potted plants or something that came in um you know that was a live plant material and has caused the loss of 175 thousand acres of pasture. And what's replacing that pasture is not native forest, it's 
weeds like blackberry, things that you do not want to have to battle if you're trying to do restoration. And also if you're a rancher, you cannot run cattle through there. That's not forage, that's not nutritious. And so ranchers are being forced to reduce their herd size. So this is impacting our economy and it's impacting lifestyle in Hawaii and it's impacting um, the environment through that propicule pressure of weeds on, on the forest. So lots of different impacts from, from that. Uh, famous um, here in Hawaii, also now significantly affecting Kauai, the uh, fungus rapid ohia death, Ceratocystis leucoohia. Uh, this is the same forest in 2005 in Puna. This is a lower, uh, there's not too many lower elevation forests left, and you can see there's some uh, impact here from introduced species, but this is mainly an ohia canopy. I can see several native species underneath in that understory, but with the loss of that canopy, that exact same forest, you lost all those understory trees. Um, and so th this is like a complete devastation of this native forest. And that's something that took place over the course of 10 years because of this fungus. That was probably introduced, they estimate, maybe around the 1980s, 1990s, um, and that's spreading across the islands as well. So that's an overview <laughs> of some of our big problems. Um, but this was, you know, all something that was being noticed uh, even 20 years ago. So the silent invasion of Hawaii by an alien invasive species is the single greatest threat to Hawaii's economy, natural environment, and the health and lifestyle of Hawaii's people and visitors. That is a quote from a Hawaii state legislature um, publication. In 2001, they declared this, and that led to the formation of the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, which is made up of six uh, departments, the Department of Health, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, DLNR, uh, DBET, and UH. And that's where we come in. The ISCs are part of UH. And each of these agencies plays a role in one of the steps in battling invasive species. So we have prevention, obviously, you just keep it from getting here. Um, if it does get here, you want to find it as early as possible so that hopefully you can eradicate it, which means remove it completely. Um, but once it's past all those three stages, you're at the stage of either trying to contain it and keep it from going further, or it could get so widespread that it's just management um, across the board. So some of the efforts that we have are things like the Mamalo Poi Poi program. Um, this is very active. Uh, looking early detection and protection where we're really trying to find things extremely early. So a lot of this monitoring goes on across the state around nearby airports and ship ports. We're looking for things like Africanized honeybees, um, coconut rhinoceros beetle on islands outside of Oahu, the red imported fire ant, uh, mosquitoes. So you have, you know, the Hawaii Ant Lab, which is part of UH. You have coconut rhinoceros beetle. The, H, the Department of Agriculture is responding to that. You have, um, you know, the ISCs are working with folks, Department of Health. So you see a lot of agencies working together, the Department of Transportation, so that we can get access to these port areas, um, really working together to try and respond to um, the potential for these really damaging invasives to get here. Um, red imported fire ant, if you've come from the mainland, then you're probably familiar with this. Uh, this is, you know, you, people come here and they hear fire ants and they think, oh yeah, I know that fire ant from Texas. Uh, we have already the little fire ant, different fire ant. We don't want another fire ant. <laughs> we already have two, we don't want another one. Um, this guy is very aggressive. People have died because of red imported fire ant. Uh, very notoriously difficult to get rid of. We do not want this ant. Uh, but it's moving around the world. Brown tree snake, this is something that has devastated the forest of Guam, has driven multiple bird species to extinction. We have a program where we're really looking at brown tree snake potential for transport both in Guam and in Hawaii. And there's a it's a great program. They're, they're, they use dogs, little beagles. They're trained to sniff out the, the snakes. And when the cargo planes are leaving Guam, they're inspected by these dogs. They're just really efficient at finding the snakes. So um, that's a a prevention program that needs to be continuously funded. We cannot let our guard down or we could end up uh, with the silent forest like Guam has. Um, like I said, one of the things that we look at with Mamalo Poi Poi, Africanized honeybees, again, a very a deadly insect uh, known around the world for, for causing the deaths of many people. We do not want that here. And we have a great honeybee industry here that we, we don't wanna have that disrupted. These are not great uh, honey producers. 
And also you don't want to go near them to get their honey. Um, the one that caught all the headlines in 2020 and got everybody's attention and got all the snarky comments on social media, of course, murder hornets. Um, you know, we don't think that that's an immediate threat, but it's the kind of thing that is moving around the world and we have to be ready for it. We have to be prepared. So it's really important that we keep funding these prevention aspects. Um, once something gets through, as I said, the most important thing is early detection. And this is where your invasive species committees on your various islands, we have really been involved over the last couple decades, mostly in looking at plants, early detection of plants that are spreading into the environment. Luckily with plants, we get a little more time than something like insects, which is where you really see like Department of Agriculture or CTAR is looking at identification of, of new insects that are brought into them. Um, but, you know, we have different agencies involved in early detection, depending on the species and that will also determine if we do find something uh, that will determine uh you know, who's responsible for going after it. So a lot of the work that we do, we have some very um committed souls with a lot of fortitude who go out there with all kinds of tools uh, to try and remove these plants from the landscape. This is this is not an easy job. Our, our crews do a lot of hard work in all kinds of weather. Um, and so you'll see this uh, effort going on for several species. And you can look on our website for a list of our target plant species that we're trying to eradicate from the big island. Sometimes, you have something that's very widespread, but still in a small area. Um, one example of this, we've worked with Kohala Watershed Partnership uh, for several years on a plant called Poison Devil's Pepper. And if you thought that that wasn't an attractive enough name, um, its Latin name is Ralvolfia vomitoria, which is, I think, it tells you a lot about the plant that someone named it that. Um, but there's about a 1200 acre area in Kohala that is very dense with a lot of these plants. And it's not really something that it's finding financially viable to um, get all of those plants. So the focus really is on maintaining these edges and trying to make sure that plant doesn't leave that area and just keep fighting it back at the edges um, and maybe reducing that, that plant slowly over time. So, you know, sometimes you have the opportunity to do something like that. And sometimes if you are driving around the west side of the island, you get to see the rolling seas of fountain grass. Um, so you're well aware of just how uh, widespread some of these species are. Fountain grass, again, would be nearly impossible to eradicate. But what we do is we work uh, with some of our partners, for instance, um, DLNR or the National Park Service to try and keep some of these species from getting into native forests where they could be a real problem. You know, a dryland forest where you have a lot of fuel from a um, fountain grass, you're gonna be looking at potential for a much more damaging fire. So controlling those plants, uh, you know, Something like little fire ants that's widespread across the island, uh, the big island, that's something that you, um, you know, you're controlling all the time. Uh, and that's just how it is with invasive species. Uh, this is kind of our, our graph. You have time as your x axis, cost as your y axis. And the lowest cost is prevention. Investing into prevention, whether it be on a small scale in your backyard or on a big scale in the islands, that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. Keep it from getting in. Um, find it. If you, you know, look for it. Look for things. Eradicate them early. Uh, after that, you're into that containment or that point of no return, which is ongoing management forever in, in, into infinity. Unfortunately, what you run into is this sort of situation where if something isn't causing a ton of problems, maybe people aren't noticing it or maybe it doesn't seem like uh, something that needs to be responded to right away. By the time people really start to notice severe problems and start demanding that something's done, you can often be outside of the space where you could have eradicated it. And so this is a constant tension with invasive species um, uh, response is, you know, we have to try and mobilize response early enough. And for many times, there are many factors that can keep us from, from doing that. Um, what we can do is more preparation. And so what this all comes down to, all those pieces that I just talked about, prevention, eradication, early detection, um, containment, all of that management, ongoing management, all of that can be sort of summed up in this idea of biosecurity, just trying to improve our uh, existence here in this islands, the impacts, uh, mitigate the impacts from invasive species and prevent new ones. And so in 2017, the state uh, Department of Agriculture and uh, Department of Land and Natural Resources 
uh, collaborated on this interagency biosecurity plan, which identified, uh, really investigated all of the areas where Hawaii is vulnerable and said, okay, what can we do to improve this? And this plan is easily Googleable. I have the link down there. You could screenshot it and look it up later. But if you just Google invasive species, Hawaii invasive species biosecurity or Hawaii biosecurity, you'll get it. Um, it's a pretty dense report. It's thick, um, but there's like things that I think, you know, are pretty common sense, you know, here, down here, more inspector positions at ports, right? We talked about that. So that's one of the things that's identified in the plan. We need more inspectors at the ports. Um, we need more invasive species technicians. We need more people on the ground, actually out in the forests, trying to battle back these invasive species. Um, one thing here, this little orange box, rules to restrict import of invasive plants. Uh, we're not, I, would, I didn't get into that too much tonight, but it is legal to import and grow and sell almost every invasive plant that exists on the planet. Um, so uh, we need to improve on that. And uh, next week, next Wednesday, we have a talk coming up uh, that I'll talk about at the end that get, gets much more into this. So if you're interested in that topic, you should uh, plan to attend that talk next Wednesday. Um, but we need better research facilities. And this one, this first one, Emergency Response Fund. Um, to allow for immediate mobilization. When you really look at that jump from prevention to eradication to containment, right? This is, there's money, right? This is the, the cost is going up. There's money that's required to do eradication. And it's not just like, oh, we'll just jump out there and do it. Most of the time, I mean, everybody's already got a full-time job. So adding a new invasive on and trying to respond to that is really challenging. You need research. You need to know how do we control it? What products do we use or what methods do we use? Do we even have that research? Do we need to have a scientist come in and, and people to research that? We don't know. And so that's kind of really critical that um, there is, uh, we don't have to sort of apply for grants and wait to see if that money comes and hopes that someone funds it, but this is not the right cycle. So it's going to be six months or nine months. An emergency response fund would allow for us to jump on a new threat and say, hey, mobilize now. We got to respond now. And that's something that I think um, our legislat legislature could set up and uh, would be a really important key aspect of uh, preventing those murder hornets from taking over the islands. So that entire plan, obviously, the challenge to anything in Hawaii or elsewhere is um, how can you get the money? You can have the plan, but you got to get money to implement the plan. So right now, it's estimated that Hawaii is spending about $57 million annually on invasive species response, only about one uh, half of less than one half of 1% of our budget. But to, Im to implement the entire biosecurity plan, which is not, it's not the end all be all, but it would significantly improve our biosecurity, to implement that whole plan would be an additional about $40 million. And that seems like, wow, $40 million, especially in the time of COVID, that seems like a lot. But um, that, that's, you know, I heard on the radio today, they're looking at, there's a bill to revamp the stadium on Oahu that would be $300 million. So for a tenth of what we want to spend to revamp a stadium, we could implement the entire biosecurity plan. So it really is not impossible for us to prioritize this. Um, you can get more information about this by visiting the Hawaii Invasive Species Council website. Um, they have information about sort of where that plan is now and what's been implemented and what still needs to be implemented. And this is something that will require legislative support. So for those of you who are in contact with your legislators or, you know, who are looking to get more involved in this issue, it's really a good idea to let your local representatives, your state representatives, even your county council representatives know if, if invasive species are something that's important to you and, and pre preserving our farms and our forests and, and our waters are important to you. I mean, this is something that you can um, say to your legislator, like, hey, I'd like to see action uh, on this. So it's worth it, especially now it's the beginning of the session. I don't know exactly what bills are being introduced, but um, we do generally send out information if you want to join our uh, mailing list at bisc.org. There's an op uh, op option to opt into our mailing list, or you can just email us at biscuithawaii.edu. Um, and we're happy to give you more information about anything that I talked about tonight or anything that's upcoming with biosecurity, um, you know, connect you with any of the resources that I showed you, the different websites or, or documents 
students. And we're also um, very active. BISC is very active on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. So if you're on either of those channels, please do join. Something uh, cool that's happening right now is for the first time, for Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month, we are giving Big Island residents the chance, I guess if you're on another island, you could jump in, but this is really for the Big Island, the chance to vote on, you know, what's your worst. So this is, we're calling this our February Madness. It's our not so sweet 16. Um, we have four plant, four invertebrate, four vertebrate, four pathogens and disease. And if you go on bis.org slash the worst, you can learn a little bit about some of these really high profile invasive species and think about, okay, what do I, I think the worst one is. And on Instagram and on Facebook, we're giving people the chance to vote. And by the end of the month, we'll have like the worst invasive species on Hawaii Island. Um, also, I want to again put in a plug for that talk that I mentioned earlier. This one really delves into the problem of imported horticultural plants that that could be invasive, um, but also really gets into the tool that we have in Hawaii that's available to anyone. It's a totally free tool to use. The plantpono.org website gives you access to evaluations for thousands of plants so that you can know before you plant something, is this likely to be invasive? Is this, is this a plant that could cause a problem? And it'll tell you yes or no. And so you can really get a good sense of like, how do I plant in such a way that I'm not perpetuating the problem? Problem of invasive species. So I highly recommend this uh, webinar next week. Um, it's going to be streaming live on Facebook and Zoom again, of course, and we'll have that advertisement on our uh, social media as well. Okay, so that's that. And I'm going to go back to this slide. And did you guys have any questions? Molly, is there any questions? I'm so sorry. We have one question. Okay. I could tell Jade was talking because when I part, like, I could hear the dog barking. Jade, sorry. <laughs> That's adorable. That's a good way to announce you. Sorry. I'm so sorry. I have to run away from them. <laughs> um, we do have one question. Because uh, we talked about um, when we, we monitor plants and animals mostly coming in. Do you know if we are also tracking microscopic and biological invasions also? Not so much. Um, and that's part of, uh, you know, one of the issues is that around the world, there isn't a lot of capacity for that. And it's only recently being identified as like, whoa, like the microclimates are changing as we introduce these things. And the there still needs to be a lot of science on that. And again, with us needing facilities. We need better facilities for research in Hawaii. We won't be able to really track those things um, without significant investment and, and also moving forward of the technology and the research. So that's a really good point because there isn't, um, th there still is, is a, a lot yet to be learned about that. And it's, it's potentially a huge problem. Kavei, anything? That was great. That was it for the Q&A. Okay. We do have one question on Facebook. So Christine asks, are there any aquatic invasive species affecting Hawaii Island? If so, does BISC do any control work for those? And another question is, what are ways that residents and tourists can get involved directly to help, whether that's volunteering, employment, or things like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, there are invasive aquatic invasive species affecting Hawaii Island, um, things like fish like tilapia that have been like let loose into our stream systems, um, mosquito fish, so things that will prey on our native uh, fishes and, and uh, invertebrates. Um, those are mostly under the purview of DAR, the Department of Aquatic Resources, which is part of DLNR. So again, when I talked about all those interagency, uh, you know, things that different agencies work on, that that's something that DAR works on. And um, we don't get involved with aquatics, mainly because we just historically, we've been the plant people. <laughs> but um, we do try to support uh, outreach efforts on aquatics and notify people. As far as... Um, uh, getting involved. We have in the past done a lot of work on, um, you know, organizing volunteer days for like response to Albizia. You know, we do a lot of training for little fire ants. Uh, obviously, the last year that's been really restricted. We haven't done a lot of 
working in the community, just because that would be very dangerous uh, for everybody to, to be gathering. But um, I think one of the best ways I would really, <laughs> I think one of the best ways that people can get involved is to try and effect that change on the level uh, of the state legislate legislature or the federal legislature. So getting, or even your county, getting to know your local reps, who they are and talking to them about these issues because, um, you know, Every one of us should should try to manage invasive species in our lives as much as we can, um, but a lot of that effort's going to be a drop in the bucket without significant, um, you know, investment and 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 prioritization that has to be done by decision makers that are above our pay grades. So, I think that's one of the best ways. I mean, it might seem a little like a cheap to be a desktop warrior with your email, but it can be incredibly powerful, um, and you know. Just one of the things I would really recommend for folks who are outside the Big Island in particular is looking for things like little fire ants. So, you know, like I, I had said here on the Big Island, it's widespread. Everyone is responsible for managing their own fire ant problem. But if you're on another island, you can keep it in that prevention eradication space by actively looking for that. Um, any island that you're on look at the world around you. Do you notice something changing? Do you notice something on a leaf that you've never seen before? A bug, an insect, something that is unusual? You know, get those things, take pictures, put them in a plastic bag and freeze them. You know, do something. Um, if, you, if you're paying attention to the world around you, report things to 643 PEST, uh, report them to your local CTAR office, your Department of Ag office, to your local ISC. Um, let people know if you see something that's unusual. It could be something you just haven't noticed before and we say, oh yeah, that's that bug, it's been around forever. But boy, I'd rather get 10 of those reports than miss one that is an uh-oh. So, I mean, there's a lot of ways that are just sort of little everyday ways that you can uh, be vigilant about invasive species. I did get a couple more questions for Annie. You ready? Yeah. Uh, so do we know what's the state of the noxious weed list? Like, is there, are they planning to put more on there? Like, is, or is it, is it moving at all? Molly, <laughs> uh, what do we want to say about the noxious weed list? That question was posed by JB Friday. So oh, just, a little con just a little context. <laughs> JB, there are other mechanisms that are hopefully in progress. Um, I know that CGAPS has been working for a long time on different plant rules. So we might, I, I think the goal is to kind of go away from necessarily the noxious weed list and more into a restricted plants list um, approach. But personally, I've realized what it would have been like to be around in 1990, 1991, when they actually updated the noxious weed list and how satisfying it must have been to actually get some of these plants on it finally, like Myconia. They finally got it on in 1992. So I don't know, kudos to all those scientists that got it on. That's amazing to me and I respect them. That's awesome. Okay, and the next question is, um, if the biosecurity plan were to be fully funded, does that mean um, it's actually like fully funded? Like, do, you, do would they would everything's like set and ready to go, or would they still need more money for inspectors, or even for us, or more research, early detection, all that stuff? Like, sure, would, would yeah, that kind of cover. Yeah, so mostly this would be about getting that plan where we're implementing um, a lot of those preventative things, more efficient responses, right, Maybe getting that uh, fund that would be able to be tapped into uh, if we have a new um, invasive come in, um, funding research facilities where we could look into new ways to control these species like biocontrol. So all of those would be things that would improve our response, make us more efficient, make us better at responding, but we'd still, we, we still have have all those species here that are widespread and they're not going anywhere and we're going to have to continue to manage them. So that cost will be um, with Hawaii forever, but it will hopefully reduce how much that cost grows with by year. So like when you look at that $57 million, that's what the state of Hawaii is spending. That's not calculating what individual farmers and ranchers and residents are spending, right? So the cost is much higher than that. And even being able to reduce that cost for folks across the board 
by helping, maybe coming up with better solutions, maybe being able to get a biocontrol for one insect or one plant that usually causes a huge problem, that could really reduce those costs um, further down the line. So, you know, a lot of things at play, but yeah, there would still need to be funding for invasive species, but the implementation of that plan would hopefully lead to the future levels of that funding having to increase at lower rates. Good questions. Guys are yeah, sharp to date. Sharper uh, than me. It's seven. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> that's all in the Q and A. Was there any more that came in on uh, Facebook? Nope. Oh, that's it for Facebook. Okay. Well, Molly, I'm done. <laughs> you can take it away. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending this time with us this evening. I mean, now you all know support biosecurity through your legislator. Be a armchair internet warrior. Um, come next week to listen to our talk about how to prevent invasive species by using plant pono. Um, that'll be next week, Wednesday. Uh, yeah, mahalo everybody for listening and I, I hope it was informative. Thanks Molly. Aloha everybody.